All righty. Awesome. Thank you guys for uh, joining us tonight for the, um, for the, uh, let's see. I was about to say the first, it is the first of 2021 of these uh, quarterly information panels for UCI. I actually uh, am one of the uh, instructors here at UCI. I've been here 13 years. My name is Kai Williamson. So tonight's agenda where we'll do introductions, uh, we'll have a panel discussion, hence the reason for the panel that we have, Ms. Vicki and uh, Leanne and Shamika. And then we'll talk about the program information in general and have some Q&A. So we just want to enlighten you on the program. So here we are with respect to our introductions. We're just going to do a short introduction. You guys will be able to do a more broad introduction as we start to talk uh, as the panelists. So my name is Kai Williamson. And as, as you can see there, I'm a senior international corporate governance paralegal. And, um, I, and again, my uh, secondary job is I do work here. Uh, I'm a part-time instructor here at UCI, and I've been here for uh, 13 years. Next, Shamika. Hello, um, I'm Shamika Polin, and I am an in-house paralegal at uh, Loan Depot. Um, my job is uh, to manage their litigation that deals with loan origination and title matters. Awesome. Leanne? Whoops, my mute button wouldn't go. Hi, my name is Leanna Sue. Um, I'm a mergers and acquisitions paralegal at Brown and Streza, which is a mid-sized law firm in Irvine, California. Um, I worked with a department of around three attorneys and a couple of paralegals, and we work on real estate transactions, um, corporate governance, and mergers and acquisitions transactions. And I just help them with whatever they need me to. Awesome, that's fancy. <laughs> Vicki? Hello, my name is Vicki LaSalle. I work at a company called Beckman Coulter. It is not a law firm. It is a medical device manufacturer, so I am in-house in a corporate legal department. I am the senior paralegal and a global legal operations manager for Beckman Coulter. So we are a global company, and I have people I work with all around the world. Awesome. And uh, just so you guys know, uh, uh, Leanna and Vicki are both alumni of the paralegal program uh, here. So you may hear them talk a little bit more about that uh, as we speak. And then Shamika actually uh, was an instructor here and uh, she just hasn't got any um, contracts uh, recently, but she teaches the tech practicum class here at UCI. So we're all involved in the school one way or another. So tonight we're going to be focusing in on these four different things. Why become a paralegal? How's the job market? Because I'm sure we all want to know about that. Are paralegals respected in the industry? We'll ask the panelists with respect to that. And then ultimately, why choose UCI for your education? So uh, let's start out with why become a paralegal. Uh, to become a working professional, maybe, perhaps a wide variety of practice areas. Uh, maybe you might be considering law school and since UCI has the law school here and it's pretty top tier, maybe you think that you need to stop to be a paralegal for a while and, and you'll have a better chance of getting into the law school. We'll talk about that. And then ultimately better job opportunities for yourself. So so guys, what would you say with respect to why become a paralegal? What, why did you become a paralegal? How about we uh, ask you, Shamika? Um. Well, it's funny because I became a paralegal, um, I won't say by accident, but it was never really in the plan. Um, I initially wanted to be an attorney, and then I also wanted to be a fashion designer. <laughs> so um, once I realized that, um, you know, being a fashion designer, um, it was, you know, really competitive and it's really hard to kind of break in that industry. And then I also did not know uh, if I wanted to be in school as long as you have to, to become an attorney. So I decided to, you know, be a paralegal after, you know, working in the banking industry. Okay. I was all Let's over the with, place. Yeah, no, let's stick with you for a minute, uh, Shamika. And, and again, we'll, we'll uh, ask the other uh, two panelists, but, I know that you said you're in-house now at Lone Depot, but you weren't always in-house. Can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Uh, yes. So um, 
So I didn't go to UCI. I actually went to Fremont College um, in their paralegal program, and I graduated um, with my um, ABA approved associate's degree. And I started working at a firm in Torrance um, back in 2008. So I started off in a law firm. Um, once I left that law firm, I went to another law firm and so, you know, so on and so forth um, until just uh, over a year and a half ago, there was an opportunity to um, transition in house. But before working in house, I was a litigation paralegal for a number of years and I am used to, you know, the fast paced, you know, um, environment, working hard, um, you know, kind of being a right the right hand of the attorneys and i did that for a number of years managing cases from inception through trial and then i'm now on the other side because i am still dealing with litigation but not in the same way interesting how about you liana uh tell us your background and you know why you became a paralegal sure so funny enough um kind of like shamika i wouldn't say i fell into it on accident, but I never planned for it either. I actually started college as a biochemistry and chemistry major, and I did not <laughs> like that at all. <laughs> and it was actually through a um, elective that I discovered that I actually really enjoy law. So I actually ended up working at a superior court down in San Diego where I went to school, and I got into family law there. And I figured, hey, you know, maybe I should start getting into like a real job, you know, <laughs> like being a paralegal. And I decided to look around at the different programs in Orange County after I moved back to Irvine. And I saw that UCI had a really good um, reputation. So that's how I got into the program at UCI. And some of my first experiences as a paralegal were through the UCI program, the internship program that you can take as a class. And that's actually how I got my first job. Good. Uh, my very first job was actually because um, a family law attorney worked in the same suite as the internship I was at. And she liked me. <laughs> so we talked and she interviewed me and she hired me. And I got into family law for a while. But I realized that man, this is very emotionally intense and I don't know if I can handle it all the time. So I actually went back and took additional classes. I took Kai's corporate law class mm -hmm. and I learned a lot about corporate law. Um, a lot of the information I learned there, I still use today. And when Kai let us know in the class that, hey, there's a file clerk position open at Brown and Sreza, I said, hey, I want to do it. <laughs> And that's how I ended up at Brown and Streza. I started as a file clerk and I worked my way up um, to uh, mergers and acquisitions paralegal. And yeah. that's what I'm doing today. Absolutely, guys. And just so you understand, that's one of the reasons I wanted uh, Leanna to be on this call with us, because she's one of our success stories. She she was a, uh, you know, just an entry level paralegal that wanted to get her foot in the door. And, and uh, ultimately now she's an M&A &A paralegal in a um, mid-size uh, major law firm in here in Orange County. And uh, so that's the type of success stories that we definitely like to tell to you guys and let you guys know about. Vicki, tell us a little bit about your background and that wonderful bachelor's degree that you got from UCI that, that I can't even understand what it's all about. <laughs> Lovely, look, they turned the video on for me. Yay. So everybody can see. Um, I think Leanna and, and um, Shamika can turn theirs on too if they'd like. Um, so, I graduated from UC Irvine, so I got my undergrad degree at UC Irvine. Um, funny, because like Leanna, I have a STEM degree. I have a degree in biological sciences with a concentration in ecology and evolutionary biology. Isn't that a mouthful, everyone? A mouthful. <laughs> and I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. I had thought when I first started that I wanted to go to med school, decided, hmm, no, don't think I want to do that and was kind of floundering, didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. So my mom told me to go to paralegal school and be a paralegal. Well, I did like my mom said, like a good daughter and 
went to the paralegal school there at um, UC Irvine, the program there many, many years ago. And it was great. I finished in, I think, 15 months. And I was <clears throat> in a position at a law firm before I even finished the paralegal program. I got a job as a file clerk. So it was really great. I had thought about going to law school, didn't want to do that. So um, I love what I do now. I think it gives you a lot of challenge and a good career where you can really use your intelligence, your skills, you can build on your experience and be able to grow in a profession if you don't want to take on that debt of going to law school. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll talk more about, you know, just the career, because, again, you you guys are here. We want uh, these uh, people that's interested in the program to kind of tell you about your day in the life and stuff. So we'll kind of be talking more about this. But one connection that the three of us have in common is that we all started out in a law firm, but ultimately ended up working now in the legal department of corporations from Shamika. She works at loan, the legal department of, of uh, Long Depot. And I work in the legal department of a corporation uh, where we do AI and artificial intelligence. And, and uh, Vicki works in the, in the legal department of a corporation where they do um, medical device uh, manufacturing and, and, and among other things. And so Leanna, how, what year did you graduate from uh, the paralegal program at UCI? 2016. You guys get my point then that we wanted to let you know we've been around for quite longer than that. So for the most part, what a paralegal, when you become a paralegal in the, in the program, whether it be UCI or any other program, you do have to kind of get your feet wet in the law firm environment before you ultimately can go into a law firm setting. So you, you can see that three of us have kind of gone that route, including myself. I actually did my first seven years of my career in a law firm setting. And then I ultimately ended up in-house, corp- uh, in-house corporate where, where I've been now for the last 23 years, but those seven uh, were in a um, in the law firm. And so basically I've been a paralegal for 30 years. I've been a paralegal for 30 years. And, um, and I've worked at some of the major corporations in America, including First American Corporation, Western Digital, SanDisk, uh, Bank of America, which is part of Carrington Mortgage Holdings. So again, I've kind of had my feet wet in a lot of different corporations. And, um, and, and so we'll be talking more about that, but we just wanted to kind of give you our background. So moving on, what is the market like right now, especially with respect to COVID? And, and we're kind of coming out, you know, we're what, what, 25 to 30 percent out of what, you know, started about a year ago. But here, these particular areas of law are still very relevant now. And, and we'll get our panelists to talk, talk more about this. But as you see here, bankruptcy, contracts, health care, labor and employment, litigation by far, and uh, privacy data and information law. And you may wonder, well, why or what's going on? I mean, and you can see every last one of these has a tinge of COVID that caused these particular areas to flourish, especially contracts. Um, Vicki, can you speak with respect to contracts for a minute and just tell us why, and in your experience, how contracts just hit such a high when COVID hit? Well, myself being in the medical device industry and my company manufactures laboratory equipment. <clears throat> so we do a lot of diagnostic tests for patients. And when COVID hit, my company did, a, I can't even call it accelerated. It was just uber accelerated development of an antibody test to market within weeks. And once that happens, that then generates a lot of contract activity where we have potential customers that want to find out about this as we're developing it. So we have to put non-disclosure agreements in place when they are actually interested in getting that antibody test into their own labs. Now we need to have a sales agreement for that. And as more antibody tests are coming out, we have researchers out there that want to test the efficacy of these different antibody tests and how they work and sometimes how they work in conjunction with other tests or the vaccination. And so then we end up with different types of research agreements to support that. So every step that we have within taking that, what we call a test, we'll just call it a test from development 
all the way through to selling, so to market, and then even post-market research that happens after that, every touch there with a hospital or laboratory or a researcher requires a contract to be put in place. So, so Vicki, have you noticed that contract, I mean, just the, that level of work has just skyrocketed in the last year? It has. We had a lot of special projects around the development of the test. And when that came up, we had special teams put in place, um, not just within legal, but across the business, working with the product managers and um, the scientists to put in place, okay, here's what we want for our non-disclosure agreement. We're going to go ahead and create that and make sure it's targeted for what they need. Um, Perfect. So yeah, it's it's been quite a bit. Gotcha. Uh, Shamika, can we talk to you about litigation? In general. And again, I I didn't you see it says litigation is not specific, but I know that you deal a lot with real estate now and maybe even more. Could you tell us how litigation has just skyrocketed with respect to COVID? And we know that litigation is always here to stay regardless of COVID or not. So um, with respect to what I do, um, I have seen um, a lot of new cases coming our way because if the company is successful in their sales, meaning they're funding billions of dollars in loans, um, then unfortunately, there's always going to be some issues with some of those loans. But I guess I can say thankfully, because that means I get to keep my job, right? (laughs) So, um, you know, the company's funding billions of dollars per month, you know, um, on loans. And so, what happens is we're getting all of these new cases um, and you know where I come in is um, dealing with loan origination. So when people are filling out their application and they're submitting the paperwork and they're getting appraisals and going through escrow, that whole process until the loan funds is the, origi- the loan origination process. So anything that occurs during that process, um, I deal with the litigation aspect of it. So we are seeing tons of, you know, complaints and, you know, demand letters and things coming in um, all day, you know, through our service of process. And so it just does not seem to be slowing down because each month they fund even more money. Um, And as well, we don't really deal with servicing yet, but I do know that we get things in from the servicing side because people have been going on um, COVID forbearance. And so Mm. there are certain rules that are in play while people are on a forbearance for the, the, you know, there's a certain amount of time, you know, the COVID forbearance. And if there are any violations that occur during that time with respect to how their loan is cared for, or if they are reported to any credit agencies for not making payments, you know, then that's a violation. And so we're seeing a lot of those types of complaints as well. So it's, um, and and not to mention the company um, has hired over 3000 people during COVID so because you guys are, recently went public, you were a private correct. company and you rent public loan, loan depot. We guys all correct. we see those commercials all the time. They're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but but right. So with the, the volume of, of employees that they have, the volume of sales, we are now seeing um, uh, even more litigation. Gotcha. And then Miss Leanna, M&A. Would you would you say that mergers and acquisitions has slowed down or where where's the peak? What's going on in your world with respect to COVID and how it affects paralegals in this industry? Yeah, so I would say right around a year ago when lockdown first started, it was not very great for M and A. M and A slows down when there's a lot of volatility, and people were scared. I had two major like 20 million dollar plus transactions just fall through because people did not want to go through with the transaction anymore Um, one of them was unfortunately in the industry where they cater to cruise ships 
theme parks ah. and hotels. So that definitely didn't work out. And um, some other people just didn't want to take the risk. Uh, what really did go up during the last year, I consistently had real estate transactions mm. in the M&A department. Um, a lot of our clients are high net worth, so they were purchasing large commercial properties. They were still, you know, trying to acquire more properties for their portfolio. So we always had work to do. For us, it was so busy. And fourth quarter was the busiest quarter that we've had in what my firm said in their history. So we still had a lot of work <laughs> to do. And I see an upward trend now that things are more stabilized. We've had um, just this week, three or four more transactions that are specifically M&A come in that are for $80 million and $70 million. So I would say that people are getting more comfortable yes. and that it's probably going to stabilize now that things are looking less volatile. Um, Absolutely. And I agree with that because, again, I'm, I'm even though um, Leanna, she does mergers and acquisitions, but she's in a law firm. I do mergers and acquisitions, but I'm in-house in the legal department of a corporation. And our first, since COVID, our very first transaction, our M&A transaction was December, December the 11th, 2020, to be exact. And that was the first one. And that one actually had started in March of 2020. Of, of March of 2020 and it got put on hold because people were scared to like you said to kind of deal they didn't know what the future held so after that everything has skyrocketed lots of cleanup or what I have but outside of that I, I stay busy because not only do I do m and I do uh, trademarks copy I do intellectual property law and I deal with some contracts and again I maintain uh, 163 entities. Most of them are uh, out of the country, uh, Latin America, Europe, and uh, Asia, uh, and Asia Pacific. So um, I stay busy, even though M&A was down, but I had so many other areas to kind of keep me going. So, and I, and again, I'm sure in all respects of all of these things that we talked about, labor and employment, dot lots with respect to COVID going on. So these are the areas, guys, uh, that are really hot right now and will remain hot because of what happened with COVID. Contracts and of course litigation as always, but healthcare picked up, healthcare law, we know with, with respect to COVID, labor and employment, people are not happy, employers are not happy and things going on, bankruptcy, restructuring, this is all part of M&A as well. And, um, and, and privacy and data security has really picked up. So if, you, if any of you guys are really uh, into IT and uh, computers and all that, that would be a great area for you to break into. So also with respect to uh, the paralegal skills on demand, this was a, a slide uh, from some information I found out during COVID. And paralegals and legal support, this is what attorneys want you to have. They want you to have a bachelor's degree. They want your communication skills to be definitely high. E-discovery and trial prep. And Shamika, we'll ask you about that. We'll come back to you in a minute about that. They want someone that's bilingual, not necessarily even Spanish, but any other type of uh, language is something that's really hot right now. Legal research skills. But again, that's that litigation, which is always going to be there. And then definitely software skills, including Microsoft 365, and then you know the suite that comes within there. And then again, I took put this here for those who may be interested in becoming a lawyer, ultimately, three plus years of experience, business development, clinical trial experience, cybersecurity and data security, and technical proficiency. This is what they're looking for in these areas. Uh, Shamika, with respect to the um, whole e-discovery, what can you tell us quickly about that and, and what uh, students or someone that's interested in this program should know about e-discovery or what should they know, period? Uh. Okay, um, so, <laughs> so basically, um, you know, when you're in a litigation firm, um, you better always be prepared to have a case, you know, once a complaint is filed and they answer the complaint, then the discovery starts. Basically, it's just, um, you know, when you have both sides of a party trying to get information about the case. Um, so e-discovery is um, electronic discovery, which um, 
requires you to pretty much understand certain <laughs> lingo, <laughs> certain uh, language, um, certain, um, you know, uh, platforms um, that you're able to view the e-discovery. Like in a law firm, you would probably have more hands-on experience dealing with um, assisting with the collection of, you know, electronic information like emails um, or, you know, um, you know, data from someone's hard drive, or you would work with a vendor who is a professional, but you would have to understand it enough to communicate with them. So if you're in a law firm, you would probably be assisting, you know, with making sure that, um, you know, you're helping with collecting or you're kind of working with the vendor to do the collecting. Um, once they do the collecting, there's going to be a point where you have to go through and review all of the e-discovery. So you would need to know how to use um, various review platforms um, that they have to look at the e-discovery, to pick out what's relevant, to redact information that you don't want the other party to see. And then you also help with the production of it to the other party but that's when you're in a law firm. Um, right. So now I still sort of deal with e-discovery, but not like I used to. Um, now um, with respect to e-discovery, I send out um, you know, notices, um, legal holds to the people, the employees that are there, um, or at, you know, I actually put in the request to our IT department and they go in on the back end and place the legal hold and then I notify the employees. But I still work with e-discovery vendors as well, but I don't have to be as hands-on as I was in a firm. I'm just sort of facilitating the process. Right. And for those who don't know, e-discovery is the information that you would have to give to the other side when the trials will well, be when the um, the suit is in place. And it's like they have to share with you, you know, what, what's not uh, considered privilege, but they have to share with you and you have to share with them. And those means can be interrogatories, depositions. You've all we've all heard of depositions with the court reporter and uh, requests for admissions and uh production of documents, all that that fun stuff. And again, you guys will learn that in, in class. If you go to UCI, there's a litigation one and two and they're required courses. So you will learn all about that. And in litigation two, you will learn all of that. You'll have 10 weeks of discovery only. So don't worry about uh, finding out more about that. So let's go back to Leanna. Leanna, um, because you just graduated from the program in 2016, what could you tell these potential students about the program or what they should not you know, what they shouldn't do as far as like, don't, you know, don't um, try to just skirt, skirt through contracts. So what about litigate? Something that you can give them that you may have done that you're like, I wish I would have done differently. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the things I did for one class, um, I definitely was still trying to balance my job and also class that I was getting used to doing everything and taking a night class so I wasn't as I guess I didn't spend as much time trying to understand everything I was like okay if I can just pass this test it's fine <laughs> I can just pass this test but I realized that for my classes a lot of my instructors were very very um enthusiastic about making sure I had like realistic or hands-on experience that wasn't just textbook related. So um, after that class, I realized, hey, I should go talk to my teachers and kind of understand what's going on more and not just try and pass the class like I did in college. Because I think for getting your paralegal certificate is different from going to college for sure, for me, at least for my experience. Because I just really... In class, I was just like, I just need to get an A, that's fine. Once that's good, that's good. But for a paralegal certificate, I really wanted to make sure that I had a good foundation during class and asking questions that did come up because sometimes instructors will kind of gloss over it because they think that you know it already. So you wanna kind of just ask questions. You wanna make sure that you're really present you don't want to skip class, you want to be there. <laughs> and you want to just make sure 
you're trying to get as much as you can because every single instructor I've had just wanted to help me. Mm -hmm. So they really want to see you succeed. And I think they're a great resource. So I would definitely use them. And Good. don't just try <laughs> and get an A in the class. <laughs> try right. and learn. Right. Well. So, so Vicky, something I was kind of start a conversation off and I want you to pick it back up. But uh, with respect to um, the paralegal program and being a paralegal in general, I just want you guys to know that unlike law school, what paralegal school teaches you is practical application. So just under know that you will leave with experience on how to draft complaints, how to answer subpoenas, how to draft articles of incorporation if you take corporate law, whatever. Whereas law school teaches you theory and how to argue. So that's the thing about the paralegal program that even if you are ultimately interested in law school, that it be, becoming a paralegal first for about three to five years is perfect because it gives you the practical application that you need. Um, would you agree with that, Vicki? And would you like to kind of add in and on to that? Yeah, I actually, I would agree with that. I have a, a, a kind of funny little anecdote on that. So I um, wasn't around attorneys or, you know, lawyers when I was growing up. Um, went to the paralegal program, you know, went to the classes, got the certificate, worked at a law firm, was taught, you know, the practical skills, learned a lot more at the law firm. So I was really able to enhance that. And I was having lunch with the managing partner one day. And um, there was a junior attorney at the firm or something, I don't remember. And they didn't really know how to do some of the things that I knew how to do, like, you know, court documents and completing <laughs> this and what needs to go when you file a complaint. Some of those basic things that we all learn as paralegals, having lunch with the managing partner, I was like, what the hell do they teach you in law school anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Why don't you guys know how to do any of this? And he, he laughed and he's like, well, that's why we have you guys. And, you know, we yeah. don't learn how to do that. You know, we don't learn how to fill out the documents, what documents are required, mm -hmm. we learn how to, you know, theorize about the law, we learn how to take the law, and apply it to that, you know, set of facts and how to argue for our client, how to, um, in a, you know, in a contract, which is actually fun for paralegals, how to understand how to draft the language so it's in favor of your client. So they're really teaching them the theory that goes behind all of this and how to critically think right. about the law. Right. Whereas again, in this program, uh, UCI in particular, because that's what we're here talking about, you will learn uh, how to draft contracts. You will have all kinds of, and, and again, that's another 10-week course where you will learn how to draft contracts up and down all different types of scenarios. I mean, if you take corporate law, you will learn how to draft bylaws, articles of incorporation, corporate resolutions. If you, you know, when you take the litigation class, you'll learn how to draft complaints and all other types of uh, litigation type of documents. So that's the difference between law school and paralegal school. So let's get to the thing that we're most interested about, the money in this type of business. What, where is the money? Where, how does this all work? Well, with respect to this particular slide, uh, this is a slide where it, it talks about the, 25, uh, the, the 25th percentile all the way to the 95th percentile. And basically, you know, the 25 percentile is the, the entry level type paralegal all the way up to the more uh, senior level paralegal. And um, as you can see here, this goes from all different types of positions that you may have in a law firm setting all the way up to. Uh, and again, these are starting salaries. This is not what your salary will be. This is just starting salaries here in the um, Orange County uh, area. Um, actually, actually, I'm sorry, this is the this is from Robert Half. This one is nationwide. I'm going to give you the Orange County area. This is nationwide, just a, um, a uh, kind of snippet of what the paralegal uh, salaries are. But let's get to something that you really could look at it and, um, and understand better. This is from Southern California and it's broken, broken down by small firm to mid-sized to large firm. And it actually breaks it down by different cities from West LA all the way through to San Diego. And if you look at Orange County, I mean, if you just look at all of the, the, the salaries here, you can see from an entry level ABA paralegal and the, the range there is from 41 to 59. 
thousand. And again, wh- why that big range? That's where do you fit in? What kind of transferable skills are you bringing with you? Just like with Shamika, Shamika has all this real estate experience. Some of you may be on this call and have you may work as a real estate agent or or work as a broker or whatever, and you have re- real estate experience. Now you're going to wrap it around an ABA approved paralegal certificate. Then that way you're not going to start at 41 because you have concepts of real estate. What if you work in in an HR department and you're doing HR now, but that really is labor and employment law. So you know the rules and the laws regarding labor and employment. Now, just say if you go work at a labor and employment law firm, you go with your HR experience and the paralegal certificate, you're going to be a force to be reckoned with. You're going to be able to definitely be on the higher end of these salaries than on the lower end. But I can tell you that these salaries are right on par. And as you can see here, a eight plus year paralegal in this industry can uh, stand to make between 90 and 123. And that's true. And that's something that you guys may have an eye opener about because you probably thought paralegals don't make over 100K. Well, they do. And well, three of us on this panel do. So I'm up here telling, I'm up here saying they're, how much they make, but you know, I know they, they make it, they're laughing, but three, but three of us do make over six and who knows, maybe Leanna does, she might make over six figures, but I know that us do. So just keep that in mind with respect to salaries, guys, is that uh, paralegals can make uh, just as much as a second, third year associate. And that means a, a lawyer with three, two to three, maybe four years of, of experience and, and, and has a law degree paralegals can make just about that much. Okay. So just, just know that when you, as the, whatever you bring to the table, that'll get you to a higher level and then it can go up from there. Okay. And then even here, this talks about Northern California. I broke and I broke it down by in-house and we, we being the Orange County Paralegal Association, which is akin to the Bar Association for Attorneys, All four of us are actual board members. We are all on the board of directors of this association and um, or former board members. And we actually work with a lot of local legal recruiters. That is how I got all of these salary surveys. We do our own, but we also work with the local recruiters. So we stay on top of what's going on in the industry and what the salaries are. So these numbers are from the one of the local uh, legal recruiters, Adams and Martin. Okay, and we, again, we have several of them that we work with, and these are the numbers for 2021. This this is not stale data. Okay, so just know that you can stand to make a, a very respectable um, salary in this industry. So, what what would you guys think about this? Are we respected, guys? What do you think? Any stories? Anybody just smiling, saying yeah? Yeah, no, we we are respected, <laughs> um, and it's. I will tell you, I, I belong to a couple different paralegal groups on Facebook because I like to see what's going on out there in the world and offer my advice to folks when it seems appropriate. There are those attorneys that aren't respectful. There are those attorneys that may not, you know, talk to paralegals in the best way that that really don't behave, what I would say professionally. Now, you're going to find that in any industry you go. It doesn't matter what your job is. You're going to find that because that's how people can be. But overall, yes, I think we're very well respected. I speak to presidents, senior vice presidents, vice presidents at my company. I talk to the guy that does the load, that manages our loading dock, receives shipments. I speak to them all the same way. I'm very respectful to every one of them. They are very respectful back. Early on in my career, the same managing partner that I had lunch with, um, we, he had a particular client that, um, owned commercial real estate property. The owner of the commercial, no client that managed commercial real estate property, sorry, property manager for commercial real estate owner of a particular commercial real estate went with a different property management company. That other property management company was a client of another attorney that, um, was part of the practice. He wasn't a full partner, but he was part of the practice. The manager partner who I was working for at the time found out about it. And I think I was working also with the other attorney. Got mad at me because I didn't tell him what was going on. 
and I lost it. Not with him. Uh, and I don't mean I like broke down and cried. I mean, I walked out of that office, called my boyfriend at the time and just started yelling. I'm like, I don't know, you know, I just going off. And so I composed myself. I went into his office and I told him, because he was really kind of rude to me. I walked in, I looked down, I was like, don't you ever talk to me like that again. Mm-hmm. I don't deserve to be treated like that. This is not my problem. This is your client. Do not ever do that again. He looked at me and he apologized. And I never had that problem with him again. Sometimes you need to stand up for yourself. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. You'll know I, the situation and you'll know who you're with, you know, who you're working with. And if it's, mm-hmm. you know, you can or not, but sometimes you need right. to, and it's appropriate when somebody mis- mistreats you. Yeah. And again, you you know, sometimes attorneys do get bad raps, but some of them, because of their stress level, they may take it out on, you know, and again, my, my attorney now, not in any way, shape or form, great guy. And, and he's the head attorney for the whole company and I'm his paralegal. So I work, the work I do is at a very high level, but Everyone always remembers someone, especially if they consider, you know, that if that person made them cry. And the first attorney that I worked for back in those seven years I was in the law firm, I remember his name, Raymond Sung. Mm -hmm. And he made me cry. (laughs) He made me cry. And it was only because he told me something. So it was partially my fault. So I take the blame. He told me something. He gave me a project. He told me everything about the project. I walked away, went back in my office, and I had to come back to him and ask him a question. I was wrong because I should have took a notepad with me and took copious notes. And I didn't. So he felt I was wasting his time by having him to have to repeat it. So again, I learned a very valuable lesson. And anytime I go into an attorney's office, I don't care who it is, I'm taking a notepad with me. So we all have those moments. But for the most part, I've never had any issues. Uh, Leanna, quickly, before we get to why UCI, what we want you to end on the same question. What do you think? Are you respected? I think remember I you're no I always want to go back to Lynn because she's a newer paralegal but what you know are you <laughs> I think I am Good. I have definitely been in a position where I wasn't um mm-hmm. and I think that you know Vicky is completely right that you have to stand up for yourself at that point I wasn't very confident in myself so I did it but I've been in a position because now because we are very high stress where I've had like another attorney, another department talk to me and he's freaking out because he needs to find something. And I'm the paralegal, the managing partner of M&A. So I must know everything, (laughs) but I really have to let them know I can, you know, try and ask my attorney and I can try to get that information to you. But if you stand here and you keep talking to me like this, I'm not going to be able to get that information for you. And I keep always telling basically anyone that I talk to in my career, basically, who kind of freaks out at me, like, I'm here to help you and I want to help you. So let me help you. Right, right. So I think Mm -hmm. that really, they just go, oh, yeah, they kind of realize it kind of clicks that they shouldn't be really upset at you because you're really there to be helping them. And I know my managing partner currently, um, he does respect me a lot because he does say you know you're my right hand man like I know I can't do anything without you um I went on vacation for like a week and he was like oh no (laughs) he let me go obviously (laughs) but he it's like you become so important to them that they forget how important you are sometimes and then you're gone and then it reminds them a little bit (laughs) so that's that's always good so I agree with that. that Yeah, I agree with that. Sometimes you become so important that it's it's hard for you to even take a vacation. And that's not always cool. I mean, I was on vacation last week and I had to kind of stay married to my emails because I'm the only one that does what I do. So people were, you know, that's not good. Anyway, we're not going to look at this video, but I, I am going to make this PowerPoint available to you guys. So I'm sure you're interested in, especially with respect to the salaries. So you can look at this video. But uh, this is actually one of my former students. And uh, we did a testimonial with her. And she actually works at the company that I actually came from the Carrington Mortgage Holdings as part of Bank of America. And uh, and um, her name is Alex Alexander. And uh, she tells you her story, her gives her testimony with respect to this program. So you, you can look at that because I will share this PowerPoint with you. Hey, but why? Hi. Oh, yes. Yes. 
Um, there's there's one. I just saw one question pop okay. up in the chat a few minutes sure. ago. Um, should we have an idea of what area of law before entering the program, or will be will we be able to learn about these before deciding? That is a very good question, and actually, um, I'm the perfect person to answer that because you actually will start the program with me in the class called Fundamentals of the Paralegal Profession, and the ten weeks you learn ten different areas of law. That's the way in which I teach the class. And so you will learn about labor and employment, trademarks, contracts, um, real estate. You'll learn because every week I'm giving you a different look. And not only that, we do have guest speaker series. So and some of these ladies here are my guest speakers. They actually come in and talk to the class about their day in the life of them working in that area. So you will be able to get that from, from that class. Okay. So why UCI, guys? Well, again, we're we're a top tier school over 42 years and counting, ABA approved, um, unique, built uh, built to maintain the working legal professional. Again, we have a all we have a new program that started about three years ago. So we have an all day full time program, but we have an evening program for those working professionals. Uh, you're more than just trained, as I was already telling you. Practical application. You will leave here with a skill set unlike what an attorney does in law school. So that, and that's something that's really cool uh, that we uh, pride ourselves on. So uh, in addition, sorry, this is that beautiful building that we will definitely probably be going back to this fall. Woo uh, but that's a, a state of our building that we built. How, Gina, what about six years ago now? It's been and we, our building uh, was up and running about six years ago. About huh? six years ago. Yeah, a good, yeah. A good estimate, yes. Yeah, so this is actually the building that you would actually be taking the classes in on campus. But for right now, we still are having the classes online uh, through the through the spring and summer quarter, and perhaps half and half in this fall. We're not sure exactly of how that's going to look, but we know that uh, we may be going back some in in the fall. I and have then, some more questions when you're ready. Kai. Oh, absolutely. And, <laughs> and we're going to get there. And that's fine. And, and again, we we're, we're love the questions. That's, so we're going to um, get there in one second. So also, uh, this is actually the home page that shows you what the uh, online class format looks like. And as you can see it, at, you know, just your standard and you can see my picture there. This is my class. This is that one class that you would be taking that told you, you would learn all the different areas of law. It's called the Fundamentals of Paralegal Profession. And it actually starts on March 29th. So you're not too late to register for this class with me. And I'm the only one that teaches this class and I teach it every quarter. So if you are not interested in joining the program for the, um, for the spring quarter, I will be teaching in the summer, winter, fall, spring, summer summer, winter, fall. <laughs> so you can uh, take that then. So here's something else that I'm sure you guys are interested in. There's 30 units to the certificate program here at UCI. Uh, it comes, as I said, it comes in a variety of formats. There's part-time evening online. That's the program that I actually teach in. But then there's a full-time compressed schedule program. And then right now, the red is very important for you guys because of COVID right now. We're teaching a combination of live remote and asynchronous. And, and the asynchronous, as most people think of online programs, that's where we do voiceover recorded lectures and you can look at it and deal with it on your own time. And, um, you know, maybe have a couple of deadlines, but, uh, but then we're doing live remote classes and in, including, um, some of the classes where they're live every week, there's a live lecture like legal research, legal writing. One of the classes, I, another required course that I teach called um, uh, Legal Career Skills, that is a live course for four uh, times. Uh, it's a four week class and it's live every single week. So we definitely try, even though we may not be able to be in person, we're trying to make sure we give you live lectures where you guys can interact with the instructors. Um, so the, the ultimate time to complete the program can be anywhere from three months to 1.5 years. Um, Leanna, how long did it take you to finish? The technically for me to finish all my units, it was a year. Okay. But 
I took extra classes on top of what was required. Right. And so that is why I asked longer. you that. Yeah. And that's that's why I asked you that, because the most most students take classes, maybe three to four classes a quarter, especially if they're doing it in the evening. Um, and it's easy to do because some of our classes like that four week required course, then there's also a five week required course called ethics. And then most of the other classes are 10 weeks. So if you add a four, five and two, 10 week, that's four classes you've knocked out in one quarter. So it can be done at a quicker pace. You just have to, you know, deal with it. And then, of course, uh, Gina, is this number about right with respect to how much it costs for the program these days? It's it's very um, close, yes. So it's about 8000 for the, the course fees books and everything. Um, the, the, the difference is between part-time would just be um, in the past with parking and all of that, but that's all different. So it's ve they're very similarly priced right now. Gotcha. Okay. So we can take on, uh, while we, when you're looking at this slide, but we can take on some of the other questions. What are other questions did we have? So we had one, oh boy, a bunch of popped up now. <laughs> um, so I want to pursue um, working as a paralegal. So if I want to pursue working as a paralegal, do I not need to worry about how do I argue and debate against other people? No, not at, all. not at all. And guys, would you agree? That's that's the least of your worries as a paralegal. Would you agree? How about you, Shamika? What do you think? Yeah, that's the least of um, my worries, um, you know, uh, for, from both ends. Working in a law firm, um, the, the biggest worry that I had when I had to bill, I had to worry about making my billable requirement and making sure, like Kai said, when you get called by a partner, you grab that notebook as soon as possible for whatever it is they want to tell you. <laughs> Absolutely. And some, and just so in case you guys don't understand, because again, I know some of you guys may be at different levels um, in your experience with law in general, but billable hours, that that's uh, well known in a law firm setting, and that's the uh, dollar amount that, that the lawyer will bill you, you know, you're billing the client. Like myself, I, I was billed out at $200 an hour, and I had to bill between 1,650 um, hours in any given year. So from January 1 to December 31st of any given year, I had to bill a total of 1650, 1,650 hours. And if I built that, I actually would get a bonus. And, a, and the bonus structure at the time was $10,000. So if I built 1650, I would get a $10,000 bonus. But again, that's not necessarily easy to do, especially if you're not getting a lot of work. And remember, everything you do is billable in a law firm setting. So you're billing the, you know, the client, you, you're billing the client, but you have to make sure that, you know, there's work to be, you know, that there's work that can be done there. So it, it can be hard. Uh, Leanne, I know you're the only one that works in a, a law firm setting out of us right now. Do you have to bill for your time? I do bill for my time. I don't have a billable hour requirement, but um, that's kind of unique. That's what I remember the attorneys told me when I joined, but I do bill um, all of my time, always, every single day, every single minute. <laughs> oh. And that can that can sometimes be a, an annoyance when in a law firm setting. But again, lawyers, it's a, it's just automatic, and paralegals is automatic. You have a billable hour over your head that you have to bill, and and again, um, the way in which that's done is every what one tenth of a minute or one tenth of and how how does that work again? It's like every six minutes is the yes yeah, six six minute and in yeah yeah. So basically, bill, imagine billing for everything you do out of an eight-hour day. And if we all thought about how, how often we bill in an eight-hour day uh, for just the work you do, now, you know, that, that can be kind of difficult. You know, it's like you have an eight-hour day, but you still haven't eaten lunch, talked to everybody at the water cooler, done all those other things. How much are you truly billing the client for? Probably about five and a half to six hours of your eight-hour day are billable to a client. Everything else is fluff fluff. So it can become a problem if you don't have the, the um, you know, the work, if, if hey, the sorry. attorneys are taking all the work. What do you say? So when you're at a law firm where they are really mean and you have a billable requirement, you're not allowed to talk. <laughs> wow. They will look at you. They will look at you if they see you chit-chatting because you need to be at your desk in your office Working. billing. 
Yeah, billing. <laughs> and that's what and I, and I guess on the point we want to make for, to you guys on the phone is that billing is something that's very important in a law firm setting. And they will make sure it gets done because because, again, time is money and money is time in a law firm setting. And the client, you know, the, ultimately, the client needs to be billed for anything you do. And and the lawyers and the paralegals, senior levels all the way down to the they want you to be billing. And that's the scary part about being in a law firm setting. That's why people try to go in-house like three of us. <laughs> uh, any other questions, guys? And I what got more was... questions up here. Oh, yeah, no problem. Go ahead. Um, so some of them are more related to the program, such as okay. registration and fees and deadlines. So I'm letting Gina type yes. answers to those folks. Perfect. Um, but I'm pulling out these questions. So this one is, do you have students in the program that go or have had students in the program that go into nonprofit for legal aid type positions? Absolutely, a lot of them, uh, several. I have one of my students this quarter, he actually, I, I got him a gig over, and I just told him about it, but he actually was able to get it at um, uh, Veterans Legal Institute, at Veterans Legal Institute, which is just like legal aid, and they um, and they help out veterans, and they had a uh, opportunity, and uh, he actually got hired in. And I've, I've, we all know of different people from legal aid who was able to actually get you know, full-time positions. One of my former students, she was a barista at Starbucks and she had got a, a, a job at uh, Legal Aid and they actually end up hiring her when she got her paralegal certificate to be a full-fledged, full-time paralegal at Legal Aid. So yes, there's lots of different nonprofit corporations that you could work for outside of just working for Legal Aid or the Veterans Legal Institute or something like that. Uh, there's so many opportunities to do good for the world in nonprofit organizations or corporations that have a for-profit and a non-profit side. So just think, just know that whatever corporation you may end up in, that you there is there is a non-profit and a for-profit side to it. Anything else? Any other oh, questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this is for us or for Gina, but I'm gonna ask it because I think that this is something we can answer. Is the certificate recognized internationally or between states? Between states, absolutely. But there are some states like uh, Texas and Florida. And what's the other one, guys? Texas, Florida, and, and um, it's one more besides California because uh, it's four of them. Texas, yeah. Florida. Um, uh, ooh, what's the other one? I can't, I can't think remember. of Maybe Arizona. 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 Texas, Florida, Arizona, and California, where they do have regulations like California. Now, guys, just, just know this is something that you will learn in that that fundamentals class with me, I will tell you about all the regulation governing paralegals. International, no. You know, if, 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 if international, someone has something, if that country has some kind of mandates, you would have to, to do with that. But all the other states out of those four that I named, you're fine to take your paralegal certificate and do what you can in that particular state. And, and I will say internationally, once you have experience, like for me, or any of us, actually, Leanna, Shanika, Kai, for all of us, we have the work experience underneath us. If we wanted to go outside the U.S., it is possible. Absolutely. Not every country has a strong, robust, paralegal-type career out there where they don't have a lot of people that, that are called paralegals, but they have people that do this type of work. And um, it's like, for me... I have, you know, in my career profile at my work that I will be an expat to Europe or um, Asia Pacific countries. So um, it, it is possible, but um, for international, but it really, I think, is for somebody who's more experienced that would run into that opportunity. Okay. Uh, any other questions outside of, I'm sure Gina is, is handling all the other Gina's ones. Gina's typing away, so <laughs> everybody be patient. I and just, also, I'm guys, just know that, again, the fundamentals is the first class you would take in the program, and um, that's an elective, but the, the uh, fundamentals is required as far as, you know, and I'm talking specifically for me, um, and uh, fundamentals class starts on March 29th, and uh, it's not too late to enroll. And the compressed is offered winter, summer, and fall. That's the the the, uh, the class, the the program that's during the daytime. So if you're not working, and you and basically you're in class all day, so you you need not be working. <laughs> and then the evening. And again, Gina is it. That's why she's answering all those questions. Gina is over the program. She's the legal also, program I, coordinator. If you can talk about your legal career skills course, I'm getting some questions about 
you know, resume interviews type things. Yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm just talking about what you do because you you kind of start and end our awesome. program with that. So um, I'm, I'm answering them via chat that way. But if you could <laughs> describe what you do, I think that would really um, give up a, a better highlight of what's going on right. at the end to help right. them prepare for their career search. Right. Yeah, and, absolutely. I, and I do have more questions too. Oh, okay. So guys, just so you understand um, that the other required course that I was talking about is a four week course. And that is one of the, pro- the uh, classes you would take towards the end of the program. But what that program, what that four week class does is I uh, teach you, in a, you know, as far as resumes and all that, but what the class ultimately does for three weeks, we're teaching, we're learning about resumes and interviewing skills and all that. Week four, we actually do interviews with legal recruiters. And again, remember I told you we have connections with legal recruiters. I bring in 10 legal recruiters because I usually have between 25 and 30 students in that class. I bring in 10 legal recruiters and you interview with at least three or four of them. And we do group interviews and individual interviews. And I can tell you now, and I've been teaching that class for four years, we usually get about three to four of the students high, um, higher just from that class alone, um, if they're interested in working. Because a lot of our people that come in this program, they, they already have jobs and they're happy with their jobs, but they just wanted to add a paralegal certificate with it. But, um, but that class is a very, uh, it's required, it's four weeks, but you do actually get to learn all about resumes and, and all of those interview questions and how to negotiate your salary and all that. And again, just like with the fundamentals, I'm the only one that teaches that course uh, in the evening program. During the daytime, there are, there are different instructors for that class. But, um, but yeah, that's the way in which I teach it. And you will get involved with all the legal recruiters in the industry here in Orange County and LA. I actually have LA recruiters and Orange County recruiters that will interview. Okay, ready for another one? Yeah. So do the courses that are in the program require a lot of public speaking or presentation? Well, that's part of the requirement for the course. And again, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't call it public speaking, but part of the requirement is that, um, and I do it for the fundamentals class. And I think for the litigation classes that they're really um, heavily involved in that. But we want you to do some kind of, um, where you actually, and that's not only you by yourself, like in one of my classes, the fundamentals class, I actually do small claims uh, project where I have two students sue each other. One's a plaintiff, one's defendant. And you guys are get you guys get to come up and argue your case because by law in the state of California, um, you can't be your own attorney in small claims. I mean, you have to be your own attorney. You cannot be represented by counsel. So what better way to be an attorney and play attorney than, than by actually getting up in front of the class and arguing a case. So again, yes, some of the different classes in the program will gear you towards that. Uh, Leanna, do you have any uh, quest- classes that did that where you actually had to do a public speaking type of thing? Uh, when I took corporate law with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I actually, had- in my corporate law, yes, you had to do a corporation yeah, from ground created- zero. <laughs> yep, we created a corporation as a group and then yes. we had to present the corporation um, at the end of our class, um, that we, but again, you had, you had people nice. with you. You had people yes, with you. Yeah. It wasn't like yeah. you up there by yourself. <laughs> no, no, no. So yeah, yes, with respect have... to that question. Yes. Uh, guys, there, some of the instructors, uh, will give you things where you are, where you have to get up and present, but you know, that's something good that you should have, especially if you want to be an attorney, you, you have to have that kind of skill set. So we kind of bring that out of you. So speaking of being an attorney, can paralegal experience give you an advantage for getting into law school? And, and, and some of you might want to answer this, but I would say that first year, year and a half, yes. After that, you're on your own. And would you guys agree? It's that yeah. first year, year and a half. And I'm speaking to some, and me saying that, I'm not even speaking from experience. I'm speaking, I am speaking from experience in that two of my former students actually went to law school. One of them actually is a lawyer and and, uh, and she was working at Chalk Hospital uh, as their general counsel, Shanice Smith, look her up. However, she actually moved out of the state and she works for as general counsel at a, at a hospital in another state now. But Shanice Smith um, will tell you that she said the first year and a half of law school helped her in this program. And she said after that, it was because it was totally different. Remember how they learn. They learn argument and all this other kind of stuff in theory. And so that didn't help her. But she said she definitely had a hands up the first year, year and a half. Awesome. OK, it looks like I probably have two more questions here, I'm hoping. Um, are there certain requirements that firms are looking for after completing the paralegal programs? 
Any of you guys want to answer that? And Vicki, I would ask you to answer that because you are a employer. Vicki is am. a very high level at her company and she does hire and mentor paralegals. Yeah. So for my company in particular, we are looking for somebody that now I have a very interesting, um, let me, let me back up. I have a paralegal that works for me, for me right now, his first job out of his paralegal program. And he went to the kind of sister program at UCLA, um, was at my company. So he went straight in-house. However, he had a lot of experience in education before that. So for me, I'm looking for somebody who is articulate, who can speak well under pressure, who writes well, and who is able to really communicate meaningfully so that I understand what information they are trying to get across. For myself, if I'm hiring for a paralegal that's going to be doing primarily contract work, I would like to see that they've had some type of experience with contracts. If I'm hiring a paralegal that support our intellectual property team, our attorneys that do IP, I want a paralegal that's had experience working in patents or trademarks. Um, for myself, when I first went over to Beckham Culture, they were looking for a paralegal to handle their international group of companies. So all of the companies they had outside the US. I had a lot of experience with internal, like US companies, not as much ex outside the US, but they were willing to train me and teach me that, which is great because there aren't a whole lot of us out there that do that. So it's, it's a nice skill set to have. But if I feel like I have somebody who is going to, I, I don't like using the word be a good fit, but somebody who is going, to, going to work well yes. in the position that they would be looking at, understanding the stress of the position, the demand of the position, the expectations of that position, then, you know, it, it's, it'll be a good match. We'll move that person on and hopefully hire them at some point if they're good. And it depends on the level I'm hiring at. If I need somebody to come in to support my commercial team, it, which is a high volume, fast paced, you need to know your contracts coming into that position. Right. If I'm hiring somebody that I want them to start learning my standard contracts, my non-disclosure agreements, my consulting agreements, my indirect services agreements, I'll train somebody if I find the right person. But I agree. I agree with the fact that long as you have good writing skills and you're and you're a great communicator and you, um, you know, and you just personable that that's half the battle right there because, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's half the battle. Any other questions that we have? Because we are actually, oh, what, eight we're minutes over. over. Yeah. yeah, we're eight minutes over, but people kept asking questions and we want to make sure we get them answered. <laughs> I think so. and, um, are you yeah. seeing students returning to change their careers? Absolutely. Matter All of fact, uh, matter of fact, I have a one of my students in my class right now. This week is their final exam. Uh, she is actually a, a doctorate. She she actually has a doctorate. She's in education. Uh, she's of a particular age, but she is done with education and wants to be a paralegal. She actually teaches full time at at Cal State Fullerton. I've had doctors. I've had lawyers. Uh, and, and, and you might say, what do you mean? How do you have a lawyer in a paralegal program? Well, we can talk about that when you take fundamentals with me. Uh, we've had, I've, I've had so many different career changes in real estate, um, definitely uh, HR, a lot of HR people, uh, human resources. So again, there's lots of second careers and that's not a problem. And just so you understand from a salary survey that we did, um, the average age of a paralegal in Orange County is 52. So if you're of a particular age, please don't worry. You're fine. Even though we're starting to see a lot of the younger um, students that actually did their, their undergrad at UCI and they're now they're rolling into the paralegal program, we're also seeing a lot of second and third career. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So don't, don't worry about that. No. Anything not else? Um, no other questions. I do see in here that Gina has asked everybody that if you didn't get your question answered, 
to please email her at legalprograms at uci.edu. Perfect. And I will make this PowerPoint available to Gina so to share with you guys, because we were at the Q&A anyway. That was the next slide. So we, we, we actually did the Q&A. And again, I'm sure you're going to be interested in the salary survey. So we want to definitely make sure that you get this PowerPoint. I will give it to Gina. And thank you guys. Really appreciate you guys for hanging out with us. And thank you, panel, for bringing your experience to the table. You're welcome. You're welcome. Awesome, guys. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Miss Gina. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, everyone on the panel, too. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.